There is one fundamental principle that applies to any competitive game. You cannot counter your opponent's move unless you see it coming. Hi, I'm Altercate and I'm gonna teach you how to play StarCraft 2. In this video, I'll be giving you a basic lesson on scouting. Scouting is the art of using the in-game tools at your disposal to reveal what lies behind the fog of war and figure out what your opponent is doing before they do it. In this video, I'll show you how scouting works, explain why it's important, show you how and when to scout, and teach you how to interpret the information you gather. Then we'll go through a couple of replays to show you how these principles work in practice. Finally, I'll cover one last topic, but it's an important one. The mindset you need to have to truly understand scouting and what it has in common with playing poker. Before I begin, I just want to give a huge thank you to all my subscribers. I recently passed the 1000 subscriber mark, which is a massive milestone, and I'm seriously overwhelmed by the amount of love some of my videos have been getting. Thank you so much for all your support. You're the reason I can keep making these videos. As a new player, your first priority should be to practice your fundamentals. If you haven't already seen my video about macro, I highly recommend you give it a look before you continue watching. But there will come a time when having good fundamentals won't be enough. Eventually, you'll match up against players who hit you with powerful timing attacks designed to break a standard economic playstyle. If you don't see it coming, you'll start to lose games even when you had a better economy and a bigger army than your opponent. The solution is scouting. But before we talk about how to scout, there's something you need to know first. What makes scouting work? To explain how scouting works, I'm going to show you an example of a specific strategy and then explain how you could scout it ahead of time. For this example, I've chosen a classic Terran strategy. This one's been around since the earliest days of StarCraft II and it's still going strong. That strategy is Cloaked Banshee. The Banshee is a flying unit with a powerful anti-ground attack. Better yet, it can be upgraded with a cloaking field that lets it turn invisible to enemy units. These features make the Banshee an ideal choice for early harassment. When this strategy is done right, your opponent's cloaked Banshee can show up at your base as early as 4.30. If you're taken by surprise, you could be in serious trouble. But how can you know it's coming? If you have good map control, you could see the Banshee flying across the map. Even better, if you have vision of their base, you could see the Banshee pop out of the starport. But these are still just reactions. To maximize your chances of winning, you need to predict the Banshee. Because StarCraft is all about collecting limited resources and deciding how to spend them, the way strategies are carried out is through build orders. If I want to make the fastest possible cloaked Banshee, there are certain steps I have to take to get there. I need a starport with a tech lab to build a Banshee. I have to get a factory before the starport, a barracks before the factory, and a supply depot before the barracks. Let's say you scout my base at 3.36, about 20 seconds before my first Banshee pops out of the starport. How can you tell what's coming? Here's where game knowledge really comes in handy. You see a starport with an attached tech lab. You can tell the starport is producing a unit, and you can tell the tech lab is researching an upgrade. You can't know what the starport is building or what the tech lab is researching, but by knowing the Terran tech tree, you can make an educated guess. A tech lab on the starport means one of three things. Raven, Banshee or Battlecruiser. But Battlecruisers require a fusion core, and you don't see one in my base. Plus, it's a bit early for Battlecruisers at this point. It could be a Raven, but the only upgrade the tech lab has for Ravens is the Corvid Reactor, and that's just not a very likely choice this early in the game. Put together, these facts should be enough for you to feel reasonably sure that it's going to be a cloaked Banshee. The earlier you scout, the less information you'll have and the less certain you'll be, which is why you'll want to keep scouting until you feel confident in your read of the opponent's strategy. Now that you know what scouting is all about, it's time to talk about the most important part of the process. 
earlier, I said that scouting is the art of using the in-game tools at your disposal to reveal what lies behind the fog of war. So you might be wondering, what are those tools? Well, that depends on what race you're playing. Before we do anything else though, there are some gameplay settings you'll need to take care of first. Click the menu button in the bottom right, then select options. Go to the tab called Gameplay, and you'll find a setting called Enable Enemy Unit Selection. Make sure you check this box and accept the changes. Enabling this setting is important for two reasons. First, by selecting enemy units, you can now see their current weapons and armor upgrades. Second, by selecting an enemy structure that's being constructed, you'll now be able to tell exactly what kind of structure it is. Different races have different tools for scouting, but the most reliable and important scouting tool in the game is the one that's available to all the three races, the Worker Scout. A Worker Scout means taking one of your workers and sending it across the map to gather information instead of minerals. This obviously comes at a cost, but the information the Worker Scout gathers can mean the difference between winning or losing. Workers are relatively fast for ground units, and since you have access to them right from the start, they're sometimes the only choice for spotting some of the game's most aggressive early game strategies, like the Zerg 12 pool. The Worker Scouts illustrates an important point about scouting. Any unit can be used as a scout. That being said, some units do make better scouts than others. Terrans have the Reaper, which is available as soon as you have a barracks and a refinery. Reapers are fast, and they have the unique ability to leap up and down cliffs, allowing them to bypass walls at the front of the opponent's base. Because the standard Terran opener is Reaper Fast Expand, the Reaper is commonly used for early game scouting. Reapers can be good at harassment too, but make no mistake, you're not there to kill workers. You should be focusing on keeping your Reaper alive and gathering as much information as possible. Terran also has access to the most foolproof scouting method in the game, scans. The orbital command has a spell called Scanner Sweep, which can target any location and will instantly reveal a large chunk of the map for 9 seconds. Plenty of time to see what's going on. But keep in mind that using scans is a trade-off. You're spending energy that you should be using to call down the mules you need to stay on top of your macro. Protoss have the Adept, a highly mobile gateway unit that can be built once you have a cybernetics core. The Adept's psionic transfer ability is a tricky technique to master, but when used right, it can let you outmaneuver defenders and get inside the enemy base. The Sentry, another gateway unit, has access to one of the game's most useful scouting abilities. Hallucination lets you summon a shadow version of a Protoss unit that looks real but cannot fight. A hallucinated phoenix with its high speed and aerial mobility is an incredibly useful scouting tool in all phases of the game. The Observer is pretty much the quintessential scouting unit. It cannot fight or cast any spells, but it's permanently invisible, able to fly and can even detect invisible units. You'll need a robotics facility to build them, but the Observer is the most foolproof proto scouting option. Finally, a popular proto strategy is to open Stargate for a fast oracle, in which case the oracle doubles as both a harassment tool and a scouting unit. It's also got a spell called Revelation that lets you keep tabs on units and structures for a while even after you leave the enemy base. Zerg have one of the most versatile scouting units in the game. Zerglings are extremely fast, especially after researching Metabolic Boost, and they're the cheapest unit in the game. Zerglings can zip around the map looking for hidden expansions, keep track of the opponent's army, or even use their incredible speed to run right past defenders to get a look inside their base. But the most useful Zerg scouting tool is also the most easily overlooked. The Overlord. Sure, the Overlord is incredibly slow. It takes about 2 minutes for an Overlord to get across a standard sized map. But by sending your first Overlord out at the start of the game, you'll be just in time to do some essential scouting. Figuring out the best way to use your first few Overlords to scout is a whole science. But you'll go far with this basic principle. Send your first Overlord to the ramp between the opponent's main base and their natural expansion, so you can see a bit of both bases. If they have ranged units, 
you can retreat to Overlord to the safety of the nearby pillar, where ground units can't see it. But sometimes it's worth it to sacrifice the Overlord to get a good look at their base. Just make sure you can afford to lose it. Getting supply blocked is never a good thing. Later in the game, you can increase the effectiveness of your Overlord scouts by researching Pneumatized Carapace, which greatly increases their speed. And once you've upgraded your hatchery to a lair, you can morph Overlords into Overseers, which are even faster. Whatever unit you end up scouting with, one important principle always applies. Do your best to keep it alive. Once you've seen what there is to see, get out, park the unit somewhere nearby, then swing back in later to get more information. Successful scouting takes a lot of multitasking and can seem overwhelming at first, but trust me, it gets easier with practice. But getting a unit into the opponent's base is only half the battle. To get any kind of benefit from scouting, you have to know what to look for. If you only use scouting for one thing, it should be to keep track of how many bases your opponent has. The number of bases a player has taken at a certain stage of the game is one of the strongest indicators of what their strategy might be. The most important signs to look for are whether or not they take their second and third bases at normal times. If they're late in expanding, you should be wondering why. Even though it becomes less of a priority in the mid to late game, you'll still want to keep scouting for your opponent's bases. If you've seen my video about strategy, you'll know that a key part of the game revolves around getting an economic advantage by having more bases than your opponents. Just as with bases, you can tell a lot by how many workers your opponent has. Counting workers is a lot harder than counting bases, but at the very least, you should be able to tell if they have about the same number of workers as you do just by looking and comparing. Over time, you'll develop an instinctive feel for this. If your opponent seems to have a lot fewer workers than you, it should set off alarm bells in your head. An unusually low number of workers can be a sign that your opponent is building a lot of army units in preparation for an early timing attack. This is especially important when playing against Zerg, since they must constantly choose whether to turn their larvae into workers or army units. The structures your opponent has in their base tells you a lot about what units they're planning to make. What kind of unit producing structures do they have and how many? If they're Terran, what add-ons do they put on them? And what tech structures do they have? Against Protoss, pay attention to how many pylons they have in their base. Protoss need to build pylons regularly throughout the game, so it's actually possible to do a pylon count and see if any are missing. If they aren't in the base, they're somewhere else on the map, probably hiding something dangerous like a proxy stargate or robotics facility. You'll also need to pay close attention to what's under construction. Remember, you can find out what an incomplete structure is by clicking on it. Also, all structures have some sort of animation while they're producing units, researching an upgrade or morphing into another structure. Some animations are obvious, like the hatchery when it morphs into a lair, while others are more subtle, like the Twilight Council when it's researching an upgrade. Something else to watch for is how early your opponent takes their gas geysers. Since gas is required for all advanced structures, units and upgrades, different strategies prioritize mining gas at different stages of the game. But sometimes you don't even need to see your opponent's structures. You can learn a lot just by looking at what units they have. If the Protoss player has an Immortal at the front of their base, you don't need to see the Robotics facility to know they have one. Even better, you now know they didn't open with Stargate or Twilight Council. At all stages of the game, the opponent's unit composition can tell you a lot. You should try to scout the front of their base every couple of minutes to see what units are there. How big is their army? What units do they have? If their army isn't in front of their base, then where is it? What I've mentioned so far is only beginning to scratch the surface. The list of things that can provide information about your opponent's strategy is literally endless. But how are you supposed to see all of this? You can't be constantly scouting, right? The trick is to know when to scout. 
Different strategies make themselves known at different stages of the game. Some build orders like Cloak Banshee or Oracle can look just like any standard economic build for the first few minutes of the game. Other builds like 12 Pool or Cannon Rush will reveal themselves almost immediately. I'm gonna give you some simple guidelines to start you off. You'll want to focus on scouting at around the following times. 1.30, 2.30, 3.30 and 4.30. 1.30 is a natural time for your worker scout to arrive at the opponent's base if you send it out around the 1 minute mark. Depending on the map, it takes about 30 to 40 seconds for a worker to make its way all the way from your main base to the bottom of your opponent's ramp. The first thing you should look for is the expansion timing. A standard build will see Terran and Protoss players start their second base before 2 minutes have passed, while Zerg players often put down their second hatchery before 1 minute into the game. If the opponent's second base is late, they're either investing heavily in technology or planning to do a timing attack before expanding. Next, look for their barracks, gateway or spawning pool. At this point in the game, this structure should either be recently completed or just about to finish up. If you don't see it at all, something's wrong. The Protoss player might have a forge instead of a gateway, indicating a cannon rush. Or the Terran player doesn't seem to have anything, which means there's probably a proxy barracks or two built somewhere close to your base. If you see a very early spawning pool, this is usually a sign of a 12 pool, a hyper-aggressive strategy where the Zerg sacrifices economy to flood you with a large number of Zerglings before you have a chance to set up your defenses. Finally, look at how many gas geysers they have taken. Compare it to what you usually see. Early double gas means they want to prioritize fast tech. No gas means they're delaying tech to take a faster than normal expansion or to do a timing attack with low tech units. 2.30 to 3 minutes is a natural time to scout if you're opening Reaper as Terran or Adept as Protoss. Or for Zerg, your first Overlord should be in a position to scout at this time. At this time in the game, you should be able to see your opponent's chosen tech path. For example, against Protoss, that usually means Robotics Facility, Stargate or Twilight Council. Another possibility is that you just see a bunch of gateways. In which case you know you're probably facing some sort of early timing attack. Also, if you still don't see any expansion at this time, you should really start getting ready for an incoming attack. 3.30 and 4.30 are great times to follow up on your initial scouting and confirm even more details about your opponent's strategy. For example, against a standard Terran build, their starport should be finishing up around this time. What are they using it for? Are they adding an armory, or a fusion core, or just more barracks? You'll also want to look at whether they've taken their third base yet. If they're still on two bases after four minutes have passed, there's a high chance they're planning some sort of timing attack. It doesn't stop here though. I focus a lot on the opening stages of the game because this is the time when scouting has the biggest impact. But scouting is a process that continues throughout the game. Of course, knowing what's going to happen won't necessarily help you. Even if you perfectly predict your opponent's every move, you're still faced with one major obstacle. You gotta know how to respond. Many scouting guides talk about specific strategies and how to counter them. But if you really boil it down, there are basically three types of strategies in the game. Aggression, Greed and Fast Tech. Aggression means the opponent is sacrificing long-term strength in order to strike a powerful blow in the short term. Essentially, a timing attack. Aggression must be defended. Do whatever it takes to survive. Cancel your expansion if you have one underway, put down a defensive structure or two, bunkers, shield batteries, spine crawlers. Start pumping out as many army units as you can from every production facility you have. If you can't afford to produce units non-stop from every building, you can temporarily stop work production to afford more units. If you still don't have enough units to defend with when the attack comes, pull your workers and have them join the fight. Yes, your economy will suffer for it, but if it keeps you from losing the game, it's totally worth it. Remember, your opponents sacrificed their own economy to make this attack happen. If you do a good job defending their attack, you'll come out ahead. Once you've held the attack, don't get stuck in your own base. Get back to your game plan. Keep expanding. 
If you let your opponent back you into a corner, chances are you'll never get out of it. The opposite of aggression is greed and fast tech. Greed means the opponent is sacrificing short-term army strength for future economy, and fast tech means they're sacrificing army strength for a future technological advantage. Greed and fast tech both call for the same response. They must either be matched or punished. For example, if you scout your opponent at 2.30 and manage to figure out that they're going for a Dark Templar rush, you've identified a timing window. You now know your opponent is investing in technology that won't pay off until around the 4 minute mark at the earliest. If you can deliver a powerful attack right before this time, you should be able to do some serious damage. But what if you're not sure? You scout as well as you can, but you still don't know what they're doing. If nothing else, look at what units your opponent is building. Adjust your own unit composition accordingly. You don't have to know exactly what unit counters which, just a general idea. If they've got a ton of flying units, make sure you get anti-air. If they're building a horde of weaker units, get some splash damage. The better you get at scouting, the more signals you'll be able to pick up, and the more ready you'll be to deal with what's coming. Which leads us to the next question. How do you get better at scouting? Studying popular build orders can help. The more you know about what strategies are out there, the better you'll be at recognizing common patterns. You can also get a lot out of building your game knowledge, things like unit stats, upgrade research times, and tech trees. And playing more games obviously makes a difference. But getting better at scouting takes more than just experience. It takes deliberate practice. Sharpen your instincts. When you scout your opponent, even if you have no idea what you're looking at, always take a guess. Just go with your gut. Maybe even say it out loud. I think it's gotta be Dark Templars. Even if you're wrong, at least you had a plan. Now it's time to figure out what you missed. The real work comes after the games. It's super important that you review the games you play, especially the ones you lost. Go through the replay and analyze your scouting. What were you right about? What did you get wrong? What signs did you miss? How could you have gotten that information? How early could you have figured it out if you'd known what to look for? To show you what I mean, let's take a look at a couple of replays together. Our first game is Terran vs Protoss, and we'll be looking at it from the Terran player's perspective. At 1.30 we can see that Protoss has gone for two gateways before Cybernetics Core. This indicates they want to get a faster set of early units. Early double gas also indicates that tech will be a priority and we probably won't see a fast expand. At 2.30 things start to look a bit worrying. Still no expansion, they're cranking out stalkers, worse, there's no visible tech, and Protoss should have at least two pylons by now, but we can only see one in their base. In this case, the missing pylon is actually across the map and is being used to hide a proxy stargate. At this time, Terran has a single barracks, no tech, and is double expanding. After scouting with the Reaper, they do put down a bunker, but they don't go looking for the missing proto structures. A minute ago, it would have already made sense to be a little cautious. At this point, we should be in full panic mode. Realistically, it would make sense to cancel the third command center and focus on army. At 248, proto starts warping in buildings near the Terran expansion. Terran doesn't see it until 320. At this point, Terran has only just started their factory, still only has one barracks, and is still building their third command center. Protoss gets a fleet beacon and sieges the Terran base with Tempests, protected by Stalkers and Shield Batteries. From here, it's a slow but sure death for the Terran. Our second game is Zerg vs Terran, and we'll be looking at it from the Zerg player's perspective. At 1.30, everything looks normal. Barracks about to finish, one refinery, but a few seconds later, something interesting happens. They get a reactor before a marine or reaper. This sacrifices a bit of early safety to add more production and could indicate they want to pump out a lot of marines in the near future. At 2.30, things get interesting. A second barracks before factory. Again, this is an indication they want to maximize early marine production. Could they be setting up a timing attack? We do see an expansion go down at the natural, so it's not some crazy all-in. Things really start to heat up at 3.30. Both barracks are pumping out units. One of them has a tech lab researching an upgrade. 
It could be combat shields, but stim packs first tends to be more common. This is yet another indication that we might be looking at a timing attack. There is also a starport under construction, along with another reactor on the factory. Is the reactor for the factory or for the starport? Definitely some cause for concern here. Meanwhile, Zerg is focusing 100% on economy. At 4.30, the picture starts to get clearer. The starport was switched onto the reactor and it's now producing units. The research at their tech lab should be almost done by now. At this point, you can almost guarantee the starport is making medevacs to support all those marines. This is a massive alarm clock going off. And indeed, at 4.43, Terran loads up two medevacs with 16 marines and pushes out with a timing attack as stim packs are about to finish. This attack catches the Zerg completely off guard and ends up taking out their whole army and their third base. At this point, it's the Terran's game to lose. Ultimately, your opponent is human, so you can never 100% anticipate what they're going to do. It all comes down to probabilities and playing the odds. In the end, that's what scouting really comes down to, playing the odds. And this leads us to a very important principle, a mindset that you should have when assessing your own performance. This is something I truly encourage you to cultivate, as it will immensely help you improve your scouting abilities and overall decision making. And if you've ever played poker, you'll definitely understand what I'm saying. It's not about whether you won or lost, it's about whether you made the right call given the information you had on hand. Did you see the signs? Did you read them right? Did you make the smartest moves you could given the circumstances? If you did, you should feel good about your scouting, even if you lost a game. There isn't a player in the world who can correctly scout every single strategy used against them. So take the pressure off yourself. Do the best you can. If you can scout at even 50% effectiveness, you've just given yourself a huge advantage over someone who doesn't scout at all. But as hard as scouting is, know this. There is nothing in StarCraft as satisfying as the first time you correctly scout a strategy you've been losing to and then pull off the perfect defense. It's just magical. And that's a feeling I want for you. If you found this valuable, I'd be super grateful if you could hit the like button and leave a quick comment as it really helps the video reach more people. I have a lot more content planned for StarCraft, but I also make videos about game design and retrospectives of games like Final Fantasy and more. If you want to help a tiny channel grow, consider subscribing. Subscribing is totally free and it's the best way to support what I do. Thank you so much for watching and have a fantastic day.